Welcome back, everyone, to the Brain Soul Success Show, where we take back our power. You're in for such a treat today, you guys. I'm so excited to have Dr. Shmini Jane with us. She's a clinical psychologist, a scientist, and as we were just getting um, started here and talking before uh, this interview, um, I said to, to Shimani, I said, you know what, I remember seeing you at an event two years ago with Greg Braden and Bruce Lipton and Anita Morjani, and you have this most amazing, beautiful voice and presence, and you, I mean, I didn't know about you before I went to that event. I was like, she is doing what? She's proving, you guys, she is proving the energy work using science-based processes. So as a clinical psychologist and scientist, and she's a soul, social profit leader, she's the founder of the Consciousness, Consciousness and Healing Initiative. It's a collaborative accelerator that forwards the practice, the science and the practice of healing. She, her two-time award-winning book, with Sounds True Publications, Healing Ourselves, Biofield Science, and the Future of Health. So great, great book. Thank you for putting this out there again. I'm so, so excited um, because you are proving a lot of the energy work that has been out there on the planet. And I don't know anybody else doing that. So kudos to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, Louise. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be part of a community. You mentioned the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. It really exists to bring us all together because as it turns out, there are a number of people that are really trying to look at this scientifically, collaborate with healers. Mm -hmm. So at the initiative, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, which I call CHI for short, right? That was uh -huh. kind of a downloaded, downloaded uh, <laughs> title for the collaborative and a beautiful acronym, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, we really value everyone's perspective at the table because in order to really grow the healing research to its fullest capacity for humanity, we know that healers have to have equal voice in explaining what healing is and even helping scientists come up with new ideas and ways to collaborate to do meaningful research. So. Yeah, I wish I, I'm glad to say, actually, that I am not the only one, <laughs> but I am, if, as you could say, one of the folks and a kind of a scribe, you know, for what is happening out there in the world and certainly a Chi thriving community um, of folks, which, you know, we can talk about, everyone can join it. As you know, I'm glad that you're a part of it. Um, mm -hmm. We have so much free, uh, free content and free gatherings online for people to learn from leading masters, including Bruce, who's actually doing our next webinar, free webinar for us. So yes, thank you. yes. Yeah. No, I mean, when you bring all those people together, there's power in groups, right? We know mm -hmm. that, you know, major healings take place in groups. And you've done, you know, all this research about the power of our minds and the energy to heal ourselves and heal others. What does the research actually say? What did you glean from that? Well, there's a tremendous amount that we've learned already and more mm -hmm. to come for sure. As you mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I've always been interested in how these practices are being used across the board. And here, Luis, we're talking about Reiki, we're talking about healing touch, laying on of hands, you know, about 10 years ago, really, no, maybe 15, actually. I did a deep dive into all the research, did what we call a systematic review, which brings together all the data mm -hmm. to kind of look at where we were at, you know, because sometimes people will say, oh, there is no data or the data isn't good quality or there's no effect. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you from putting all those studies together that all three of those things are not true. First of all, there are a lot of studies there are hundreds of studies, actually hundreds of clinical trials and over 125 randomized controlled trials, which are still considered a gold standard for research in clinical settings. So dispel myth number one, <laughs> yes, there is, there are studies too. We evaluated the quality of those studies and they were actually fine for us to make inferences. So the quality is improving. And at Chi, we've been doing things to help improve the quality worldwide. Mm -hmm. We can talk about that. You know, I, I could talk all day long about all the things we're doing at the initiative. So there is evidence, there's good quality evidence. And in terms of what it says, robustly, when we look at all the data, we see that these have proven effects for mental health conditions like anxiety, post-traumatic stress, fatigue in breast cancer survivors, which as you know, I did a randomized placebo controlled trial at UCSD, mm -hmm. which is my alma mater, you can say, and where I've had a faculty position for many years. Um, 
showing the effects on fatigue. But not only that, I mean, pain is another one that we see mm -hmm. reduction in pain, some, some promise for improvements in dementia, and we really need more studies there because there's something really beautiful happening that we need to kind of deepen our understanding of. So we're seeing across the board that it relieves suffering in all these ways for so many different kinds of patients, both in and out of the hospitals. But we're also seeing these effects in the biology, in the physiology. And some of the latest studies, which as you know, I share in the book, yes. are even done with cells and animals where we're seeing that energy really has a way of getting under the skin and shifting the traveling of cell messengers in the body in ways that can prevent the spread of cancer. These are studies that are being done at MD Anderson Cancer Center that have nice. been done at places like University of Connecticut and even Harvard, where we're looking at these energy healing therapies. And it's not just one, several different kinds, external Qigong, therapeutic touch, Bankston method, all of these have been studied. And most recently, we've really drilled down into some of the ways in the biology that things are moving. So we're seeing changes in inflammatory cytokines, which are mm -hmm. basically cell messengers and cell transmitters, the way we think of neurotransmitters in the brain. Cytokines are immune transmitters. So we see shifts in the immune transmitters that are related to cancer spread and growth. We even see changes in things like protein kinase signaling in the body in response to energy healing, all with those downstream effects of helping prevent the spread of cancer. And there's so much more for us to explore. It's an incredibly exciting time. And Luis, I know that, yes. you know, the, the research is great. It's important because when we publish these scientific studies, we mm -hmm. can then go to hospitals and clinics and say, look, we really studied this like robustly. Yes. Deeply. And as we build that level of evidence, we can go to those hospitals and clinics and say, we need to incorporate these healing therapies in those settings. But let's face it, for most people, they don't just read, you know, a scientific study that's sitting on the shelf. First of all, most of us can't even access those studies because of paywalls, which don't even get me started about that. It's terrible. <laughs> yes. At the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, we try to like make sure that these results are out to the public in ways that we can talk about them with our community. So, you know, my, one of my board members calls this the Starbucks conversation. Like, okay, how do you have this conversation with somebody that says, oh, this is all woo woo and it doesn't really work. So how do you kind of explain mm -hmm. to people that it does. So we provide a lot of resources at Chi. And right now what we're up to is we're doing a wonderful documentary on this whole field. It's called The Energy That Heals. And people can learn about it by going to theenergythatheals.com. All, you know, one word, theenergythatheals.com. You'll see our trailer for the documentary. We're about 75% of the way done with filming this year. We hope to release this film broadly, globally by beginning of 2025. And Louise, we have interviewed the most incredible patients at VA hospitals and other places with beautiful stories that are teaching us so much about what healing is and their journey. Mm -hmm. And of course, the power of energy healing, but more broadly, that healing isn't just curing, that healing is about a return to the soul, a return to the spirit. And that when we do that, we can begin the healing process because we're setting up a container for the body to do what it's meant to do because the spirit is guiding the process. So we've got all the leading lights in the film. Deepak Chopra was our first interviewee. He was a founder of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative along with us, so like one of the founding advisors, I should say. We have, of course, our dear friends, Bruce Lipton and Greg Braden. We have Lynn McTaggart. We have Donna Eden and just, you know, all the who's who's. Mm -hmm. all several amazing indigenous leaders that are helping us understand that this is a timeless practice that has been around in many cultures for millennia. Again, dispelling the myth that this is just some new age therapy that was just developed recently. Not true, as you know. Yes. It's been a long time. So we're and of course, the scientists. So we're bringing all of those streams of wisdom together, which is what she does in this documentary, so that everyone can really benefit from the real knowledge and depth and the inspiration behind these practices. So we really hope to get this out there more broadly to the community. And it's been really fun, as you can imagine. Kind oh, of I can tell as you're explaining it to me. I'm just like so excited because again, what a great time to be on the planet, right? Being able to share all this. And you do, you share a lot of that in your book that these are ancient practices. 
they this are. This has been really, around for around for years. Touch on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, what's lovely is because you know I grew up here in the United States, born born um, East Indian by descent, and grew up in a spiritual tradition called Jainism. Um, Jainism is a very small religion, almost philosophy, with some philosophical um, kind of focus that's similar to Buddhism in some ways, and that we believe that the soul is eternal. We believe that liberation is to liberate the soul freely from all karma, you know, so all of that is resonant. But the biggest thing that Jainism is known for is ahimsa or nonviolence. So mm -hmm. I grew up in that tradition. I was reading books about metaphysics and the nature of the soul and subtle bodies and the impact of yoga from an early age. And then still being a skeptical scientist, I wondered, well, all these yogis are saying things about how yoga affects the autonomic nervous system and they're saying things about the subtle bodies, but how do we know, right? So that kind of set me on my path mm -hmm. to explore this through Western science as well. And you know, what I've learned and what I've shared in the book is that there really are these beautiful linkages mm -hmm. between what the healers are saying is happening and what the ancient systems have described as how it works. So in the book, as you know, I talk about the subtle bodies, the Jan theories of karma, how it all relates to energy healing, and how when healers say I'm working on the karmic level, or I'm working in the DNA, how that actually could be showing up from both an ancient philosophy perspective and what we know about the evidence. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, Louise, as you know, the biggest thing is, okay, so how do we incorporate this? in the day to day. So the last part of my book is called the healing keys, which I actually teach also in workshops. In fact, I'll be teaching a workshop on the healing keys this year at Esalen Institute in Big Sur. I've been teaching there for years, beautiful, beautiful place to be held nice. by the land. Um, so we make those really come alive and explore how do we work with not just our minds, mm -hmm. but our energy and marry the two for powerful healing because ultimately and I, I think everyone can relate to this ultimately it's about our practice right yes we all need a practice i'm sure you know most people listening here have a practice you know a morning practice an evening practice something that they're doing to um to work on their soul level to really move the needle forward for themselves yeah yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, I hope the yeah. book you know, is a is a great resource. I've gotten a tremendous amount of great feedback from healers and spiritual entrepreneurs like yourself saying, thank you for connecting all these dots and helping me kind of share where the evidence is and giving me some ideas of tools and tips that I could use, whether for myself or my clients. Um, yes, yes. You've done such a great job with this. Again, I am so in awe because I mean, the the research that you put together and the the um just the platforms for everything to really get it out there and now your documentary the energy that heals coming out there too you know give us the definition of biofield science yeah i'll be happy yeah. to it's, yeah. it's a growing term and i'm happy to say louise that you know when i first started out what 20 years ago in this field nobody had even heard the term biofield mm -hmm. and Gosh, it's a hashtag now, you know, on social media, like if, if that's some kind of metric, I don't know. But but even in my workshops and things, when I ask people who's heard of the term, now most people are raising their hand, whereas before, 10 years ago, almost nobody was. So it's a great mm -hmm. term for us to use, especially when we're talking to people who are interested in science. And essentially, it refers to not a singular, but a plural, meaning that they are mm -hmm. interpenetrating and interacting fields of energy and information that guide our health. So we can study the biofield of a cell or the biofield of a person, the biofields between us, the biofield of the earth. And we are doing that in all these ways. Different scientists are looking at the biofield in all these ways. The other thing I like to tell people when they ask about this, which mm -hmm. might be useful for you all when you talk about it is, some of these aspects of biofields are measurable and we've known about them forever like looking at our ekg or our eeg you know measuring our heart and brain waves which tell us something about the state of health we even have devices like transcranial magnetic stimulation where we're putting biofields electromagnetic energy in the body to shift mm -hmm. the biology and the mental emotional states yes. so we know that we're using biofields in medicine can we directly measure prana or chi no, 
And we may never, and that's okay. We're, we're measuring the physical reverberation of that field. Yes. But that's so meaningful and important. I am not in favor of us trying to reduce what ultimately I believe are spiritual experiences and phenomena down to physicalizing it only. I think the physical is part of it. Mm -hmm. We do in our studies measure direct experience of people, you know, by doing qualitative interviews and reporting on those and publishing those studies. That's important. Uh -huh. But there's so many ways to measure biofields and the impact of biofields and the physical is just one level. It's important, as we mentioned, for medicine because they right. really physical. they like that. Yes. Yeah. But it's just as important for us to be measuring the experience the direct experience of healers and people who are being healed. So we really come to a deeper understanding of what it is and how to facilitate it in clinical care. Absolutely. And you did a great study I read in your book about cancer with cancer patients um, yes. using Reiki, I think it was, right? And, and that was a really beautiful study. Share that with us too and the results of that. You bet. So it was actually with laying on of hands, which in a hands on practice called energy chelation, which was initially developed by my healing teacher, actually, Rosalind Bruyere, who's considered a grandmother of healing in many circles. Mm -hmm. Rosalind's technique, though, of energy healing has been incorporated by Reiki practitioners, healing touch practitioners and others. So it's a pretty common technique where you place hands physically on the body and you sink. This is what Rosalind has taught us to do. Mm -hmm. really sink into the body to feel through the tissue and do what she calls stimulating bone marrow chi. Yes. So when I did the study at UCSD, I went to Rosalind and I said, Rosalind, no one has any solutions for cancer related fatigue, you know, biomedically or even mm -hmm. behaviorally. There was no gold standard treatment for cancer related fatigue, even though it is the number one complaint among cancer patients and survivors. And I said, we got to do something about this. I'll bet energy healing could help intuitively, right? You think they're exhausted, they're depleted. We need to stimulate their vital energy. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Rosalind said. And she said, do chelation. It will stimulate bone marrow chi and draw out toxicities from the body. So you can imagine I went to, you know, my colleagues at UCSD and said, oh, we're going to do energy chelation, you guys. It's not real physical chelation. We're going to do energy and it's going to stimulate the bone marrow chi and draw out the toxicities energetically, which is going to draw out the physical toxicities, right? Well, you can imagine for a lot of people, like, we were crazy. So we pitched it really as a placebo controlled trial because I was really interested. Placebo is a whole thing, right? We can talk about that all day long as you know. Yes, I, I had a question about that. in my book on that, right? Yes. So we did a randomized placebo controlled trial where we had skeptical scientists mimic the hand positions. They all the patients received the hand positions and the healing in silence to kind of minimize the the therapeutic effects of just talking. Mm -hmm. But you know there was positive interaction and stuff. And here I was, Louise, a really young scientist at the time, and I was just like bent. You know, I said, we've got to like figure out the placebo question because everybody just says this is placebo. Well, is it true? Is it really just placebo? Let's find out. <laughs> so not only did we have the placebo group. But after each session, I had them rate the patients who received, whether we called it hands on healing or touch alone, we said to them, look, you're going to get touched. It may be energy healing. It may be touch alone. Both are shown to have beneficial effects, which is true. So we kind of set up expectations equally. Uh -huh. Then they get the sessions in silence. Some are trained energy healers. Some are just skeptical scientists. And then we asked each patient, what do you think you got? Do you think you got touch alone or do you think you got energy healing? How connected did you feel with your practitioner, regardless of what you thought it was? And how much do you think this is helping you with your healing? Because all of these are placebo factors, right? Yes. Even relaxation is considered a placebo factor. Belief in receiving healing is a placebo factor. Sense of connection is a healing factor, a placebo factor. So we put all that in the analysis. Mm -hmm. And what we found was the people receiving, the women receiving energy healing, they started out, Louise, at what we would consider debilitating amounts of fatigue based on this clinical measure we had of multidimensional fatigue. So, and they were telling us, they said, look, I know what I need to do for my energy, but I just can't do it. 
I used to meditate, I used to exercise, but I'm so exhausted, I can't even do that. So that's how they started out, just to give people an idea of where they were. Where right? they were. Mm -hmm. Significant fatigue. By the end of the study, which was only one month, people receiving eight sessions, two a week for four weeks. At the end of that four week period, the women who received energy healing dropped down to fatigue levels of what you would expect for people walking down the street. That is almost nil, right? And the women who received the touch only, they dropped significantly too, but to levels that you would expect for a cancer patient about to go through chemotherapy. So sizable, but not as much. Mm -hmm. But what floored me, Louise, was it was only the women who received energy healing that showed a regulation in their cortisol rhythms after the intervention was done. So they literally showed a physical effect in cortisol hormones. And as you know, I dive into this deeply in my book and explain what that means and the relevance of it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what it meant was energy was getting into the physiology and shifting it in a way that we couldn't explain by placebo factors or even clinical factors like body mass index or chemotherapy status, which can also drive effects. I couldn't make the effect go away. And that's when I started learning more about the work of some of my colleagues doing this work. They were seeing effects on immune system function. They were seeing effects on cells and animals. And that's all of what I detail in the book and that we'll be sharing in the documentary is, it's not just my study. It's many studies at this point that are pointing to these profound effects with energy I, healing. I love that. And again, the creativity there and using the placebo effect and how you even segregated and had the scientists using hands-on healing and the energy healers and had that whole study done. It, it was absolutely brilliant. And yes, you know, I love that you're proving or helping people see that energy healing is affecting the physical body. Yeah. You know, I've been doing neurobiofeedback for over 20 years, and mm -hmm. I have different biofeedback programs that do that, you know? So, like, people will go, well, why don't you go get a blood test? I'm like, because I can change my blood when I come home. <laughs> that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> you know? Hey, that's, that's beautiful that you're sharing with people. And, I mean, what we're learning just as we're getting to explore the subtleties of the biofield, too, is that... It's incredibly dynamic, right? And yes. we probably as practitioners have a sense of this. You can feel how quickly you can shift your field. And the truth is we haven't had yet the best ways to measure those direct shifts in physiology. We've been talking about things like lab on a chip for some time where we could take a drop of blood and start seeing those shifts in the hormones. You know, mm -hmm. that technology is being developed, but the energy, as you know, moves as quickly as a thought, really. That's what I believe. Yes. I believe our energy can shift that quickly. And since we know that energy can shift biology, it makes sense that if we continue to shift the movement of energy in our body by uniting it and marrying it with our mind and having directed focus, as we do with Tai Chi and Qigong and meditation and yoga and prayer, then we will shift our biology long term as well, not just short term, but we can actually shift the chemistry in our body with our energy. So I'm really excited for us to continue that exploration in science with healers so that we can really have some fun with these questions about how, how often do we have to engage in field shifts? And here we can talk about not just individually, but collectively. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. To shift our trajectory as a humanity, physically, meaning in our bodies, but also in society. Yes, I believe that too. I still remember when Greg said, um, only 1% of us needs to be in the light to cancel out the dark. Mm -hmm. And it's literally a shift collectively that will shift, ever, shift everyone else too. Mm -hmm. So it's our own inner work, right? Doing our own inner work is going to change, change yeah. the planet. So the more people that can like be a part of your consciousness and healing initiative, be a part of this kind of community, you know, really working together on this is how we're going to make the biggest changes. You know, I'm yeah. just remembering this when you were asking about, or I was talking about blood. Um, I remember years ago, I had a woman doing live blood analysis in my office mm -hmm. and we'd have people hooked up to biofeedback. And in real time, we were zapping bacteria with biofeed with biofeedback, bacteria, yeast, parasites, and then we had another screen open with the live blood on it. 
And we watched in real time the blood shift. I love that. Yeah, I love that. I've heard many stories about this with, of course, the Rife machines and other ways mm -hmm. and, and with biofeedback. That's amazing. I mean, that's the other thing that is a huge takeaway for me and which I share in the book is that there are so many ways to shift our biology through energy. Yes. You know, there's so many ways that we can do this. And it is really fun to kind of see it in action with something like live blood analysis. You know, that's really a neat way to see it because sometimes, you know, we're not going to go and get blood tests every week or whatever. But again, I, I like to remind people, and, and you know this as a biofeedback practitioner, that you can get direct feedback, again, by tuning into your energy and your physiology, your, you know, and the wisdom of the body, the wisdom of the physical body will tell you right away, is that food good for me? You know, yes. is that what I'm right now? Like, do I need to exercise or do I need to do yoga? Do I need to be out in nature? You know, do I need to spend time with a loved one? Like the body's wisdom knows that too. We don't always mm -hmm. have to rely on those external metrics to tell us. Yeah, it's that internal. It's the listening. It's the deeper listening, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing that deeper listening. Um, you had a term that I practice saying, psychoneuroimmunology. Oh, fantastic. You, <laughs> you get the degree. Me, do, I get the, <laughs> do I get the prize for that? Tell us what that is. You know, I just like that so much. I was like, we were, we're kind of describing it here, but give us the definition. Yeah, yes. Louise. Psych, psycho here refers to psyche, not like crazy, but psyche as in uh -huh. spirit. spirit. Actually, if you look at the actual translation of psyche, it's actually spirit. But of course, the scientists like to say it's the mental, emotional. Well, it's the spiritual as well. So that's psyche. Neuro, the neural axis, right? Our central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord and immunology, our immune system. Why did we put those three words together? Because 50 years ago, when scientists and doctors were getting laughed at because they said, you know, I'm noticing a psychological pattern in my patients that have certain chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, the mainstream scientists were like, that's not true. The immune system isn't even connected to the brain and emotions have nothing to do with it, right? Literally, this is like 50 some years ago, people thought this. And then because of these careful experiments, again, we won't have to get into detail. It's all in the book, as you know, we found out that no, the brain is really connected to the immune system and the endocrine system. And now we have a physiological pathway for understanding how our thoughts and our emotions affect our health. And so what I like to say is biofield science mm -hmm. is just a natural extension of psychoneuroimmunology because now we're looking more closely at the psyche and extending beyond just chemicals to the energetic dimensions so that we can begin to explore how shifting the energy shifts the biochemistry all again really programmed by our thoughts and our emotions and our spiritual life so psychic immunology kind of just holds that reality for us in the science world right now yeah that's beautiful and again you know i lived that i kind of lost my brain power got super sick oxygen three years, 89 pounds, had to heal myself. That's how I became a naturopath. And wow. at that time, my brain didn't work. And I was just like, wow, man, I just got, I was in my thirties. Right. So I was like, I got to get my brain power back. This is crazy. I feel like I'm an Alzheimer's, you know, and I'm only 32. Um, and so I saw, and I felt it in my body, the connection between the brain, between the emotions, between the psyche, but I didn't have help. I was mm -hmm. on my own to kind yeah. of do that whole journey. So the fact that there's even help out there and people like you, you know, explaining this, using it, teaching it. Ha, oh, thank you, God. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> it's like, just, thank just you. thank you. Thank the spirit. Thank the divine. Thank, you know, you've done such a beautiful job with this. And I know that, you know, life still has its bumps and its challenges, you know? Oh yeah, it does. You know, being a social profit leader is a labor of love. I'm very honored and privileged to do it. I'm honored to do the teaching that I do and the writing and all of that too. And um, we all have our life's challenges. What I've learned so much from the community that I help steward and hold is um, how much community is important mm -hmm. because we're, life is you know, a beautiful combination of joy and suffering. It's part of the process of being human. And again, you know, 
one of the things that the science has showed us is how important connection is for our mental well-being and our health. And there's so many ways, again, that's been looked at. But one of the things that we've learned is that it's not about the number of our support. It's not about the Facebook followers or anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. It is about the quality of connection. And I really encourage people when we're going through those difficult times to make time for connection. First of all, Mm self-connection, resource, give ourselves time and space, give ourselves time to process, whether it's in nature, whether it's with a pet, whether it's with a loved one, to be there for each other and also make let let someone be there for you you know as healers Mm -hmm. it's very easy for us to fall into because as we could talk about this all day long too you know the wounded masculine complex that has been sort of overlaying this planet for a really long time we all know it's time for all of us to let the divine feminine rise in us personally Mm -hmm. that's what i see this work as being it's putting the shakti the divine shakti back into medicine that's how i see it that's part of my motivation Um, as a devout spiritual practitioner, Um, but also we don't want to fall into the wounded healer complex, which is part of the wounded masculine issue that we've been struggling Mm. with for a while. Good point. So so when we make ourselves available to be held and be in silence and space, we are allowing for the power of the divine feminine to help lead and guide our lives. And that's really critical for us at this time as a collective humanity to do that. So it's yes. an invitation for all of us to make sure with all the busy things that we do, <laughs> you know, we make that time and space for ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And that's for men too. We're talking about divine feminine for it's everyone here. Gender identification, you know, the divine masculine and feminine are principles that are part of our soul nature for all embodied souls. Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. Very important that people understand that. Yeah. And then what about your practice? I know you have a practice. We talked about this even before we jumped on um, that you do, you know, to help yourself and really tune into your own bio field and get your own, you know, field working for your own healing. Um, what, What is, uh, what does Dr. Jane do here? To do many, that. many fun things that I like to engage in some things that I do on a daily basis, others, you know, on a weekly basis, and I articulate a lot of these in the healing keys, which is the last part of the book. Um, in short, as I mentioned, I'm a lover of sound, I'm a singer. Mm-hmm. So I make a practice of singing every day. Again, great health benefits from singing, but also a wonderful way using sound is a great way to tune into your energy. This is part of what I teach in my workshops, my in-person workshops, because Mm -hmm. I feel like many of us have had learning to shut down the voice in some way, whether it's I don't sing or I can't sing or I'm tone deaf or I'm afraid to speak in public or I'm afraid to speak speak my truth. Working with the voice every day, whether chanting, singing your favorite song or just making some vowel sounds and tuning into energy. And we can even do a practice, Louise, if you want. Um, A beautiful way to tune in to harmony. And mantra practice for me, whether silently or in person, is a great way of opening to the divine feminine forces in my life. So that is a regular practice for me. And being in nature so that Mm -hmm. I'm not just surrounded by human biofields, but I'm actually surrounded by the biofields of trees and the creek and the earth and the birds um, to remind myself that I'm part of a larger whole and listen to their fields and the information that they're containing and the wisdom that they're containing. So, you know, these are, these are things that I have found to be enormously helpful in my day. And look, you know, Mm -hmm. we're all busy. So sometimes my students stress out about like, well, I gotta make time. How do I make time? And I remind them, look, It doesn't have to be as formal as sitting on a cushion. I've got a pretty packed schedule. I have a certain time of day every day where I'm cooking meals for my family, my kids and my husband Mm -hmm. at a certain time. And whether the kids like it or not, I will turn on the music and I will sing and dance while I am cooking. (laughs) It will replenish my energy, Uh put love into the food while I'm cooking. So it's not like, oh, I'm so tired. Like, you know, cook. No, like, you know, put a little joy in your body while you're doing something that you got to get done. Oh, and that's food was so good, right? Because there's joy in the food then. 
Exactly. You know, everything is energy. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It makes the food taste better. Yeah. yeah. That's really, really beautiful. I was so intrigued also with your background, you know, and how you learned to even be in this world of, of energy medicine and biofield work and everything that you do. Um, you were so blessed to have, you know, really beautiful parents too, who helped you on the journey and, um, and your religion. Um, Describe a little bit more about that for us. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mentioned Jainism is, first of all, it's a really small religion. Um, only maybe 1% of the entire world would identify themselves as Jans because it's not a proselytizing thing. It's honestly more of a philosophy in some ways mm -hmm. than a religion. Um, as I mentioned, our biggest uh, tenet is ahimsa, which is nonviolence. And I think that tenet speaks for itself in today's time. So we talk about nonviolence in thought, word, and deed. Um, nice. We understand the karmic effects of violence, you know, for our own liberation. But that also, again, it's not just about like a formula. Mm -hmm. Nonviolence will help your soul towards its own freeness and full evolution and liberation. No question. Mm -hmm. But it's also about recognizing the interdependence and the oneness of all things. So when I see a bug, which yes, everyone screams when we see a cockroach, at least my family does, blood curdling <laughs> screams <laughs> yeah. with my yes. children when they see a cockroach, which happens here in the South. We don't squash it. We, you know, we cup it and we take it outside to freedom. Why? Because I remind the kids, they're not life-threatening. They're not going to kill you. <laughs> they're not uh -huh. going to bite you, okay? Um, so, and they deserve to live. All creatures have a right to live because they are part of the same fabric of the universe. They are Shakti. They are oneness in this mm -hmm. particular form. So respect them and they have to respect our boundaries of like, this is our home and, you know, we, please respect this and we're going to take you outside. They're probably happier out there anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's one tenet. Another tenet that I think of Jainism, which I think is really useful for our times, mm -hmm. is what we call Anikantavad, which means non-absolutism. Anikantavad, non-absolutism, which means many paths of wisdom to the divine. All paths mm -hmm. can be sacred. All paths are welcome. We get to choose the path to our liberation that we want. We don't have to tell other people how to think or be you know, Jans obviously follow Jainism, but they mm -hmm. respect that everybody has their way. So in that way, it's a universal principle that we can apply even in a conversation about, God forbid, politics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we, these days, most of us have strong feelings <laughs> about oh. politics, the way we want the country and the world to run. And again, why? Because many of us are concerned about the violence that are coming, it's coming out there. And so there are questions about how do we work with things politically to minimize violence? And many people will have different opinions on that. Anakantavad teaches us that if we're really going to move to nonviolent action, because nonviolence doesn't have to be passive, it can be active. Think about Martin Luther King, think about Nelson Mandela, think about um, Gandhiji. Mm -hmm. That was an active movement to nonviolence, which had real effects in society. Again, it starts with us being able to hold space and listen mm. and honor that someone else may have come to their understandings in a completely different way than ours and they need to be honored and respected as humans. We may not agree with them. We may mm -hmm. not want to follow their path, but we've got to respect them as human beings because if people aren't heard, forget it. The door is shut. We're not going to get anywhere, right? And that's hard because it takes time. It takes space. We're all feeling time pressured all this time in this Maya that we've created for ourselves where time itself is an illusion, okay? And yet we're all bought into it. Yeah. So. Anukantavad is has been a really great guiding principle for me in my life. And it's actually part mm -hmm. of what we call in our values for the consciousness and healing initiative. We call it multiple perspectives. It's actually what informed me and inspired me to bring together the voices of healers, of artists, of scientists, of indigenous wisdom holders, because mm -hmm. we all have value and important information to share for collective humanity. 
And then, you know, there are other things like aparigraha is really almost, I would almost translate it in today's times as the law of sufficiency. You know, it's kind of a restriction in, in, in old times, we talked about it really as you restrict yourself in terms of the things that you need materially, right? So that you're sharing for everyone. So I like to think of it though as the law of sufficiency because it's an internal process first mm -hmm. where we say, first of all, of course, I am enough. We all know that's like the, when we heal that, like a lot of things can shift in our life. <laughs> yes. I am enough. I have enough. What are the things that I want and desire? And what are things that I can let go of that I no longer need that someone else can have? Whether it's clothes or money, you know, how do I want to be part of the larger change by donating money, time, effort, heart, um, to be part of the wheel of co-creation? And I can trust that I will receive everything that I need for my path. So, you know, those are three basic tenets of Jainism that I think are really useful for our times. I love that. Like when I was reading about that in your book, I was just like, I want to do that. I want to be that. I want, I would have loved to have been in that philosophy, mm -hmm. that religion, that whatever. I, I live that, but I don't have labels for it. Yeah, it's great. You know, and we don't need the labels. Look, if you we're know, living I mean, like, yeah. way, it doesn't really matter, but I think it's great that so many of our, you know, spiritual traditions have known this truth and remind us when we forget. Yes. Oh yeah, this is a natural law. Like this is a governing principle. Mm -hmm. Did I fall off? Did I fall off for a second? Did I like, you know, crave that Porsche or whatever it was? And was that really sustainable for me? Not that there's anything wrong with buying a Porsche, but is that sustainable for me in my life? Um, you know, how do I want to make my conscious choices about what I do for myself and what I do? Is it in alignment with the planet and global warming and what it needs? You know, all of those things. So these yeah. principles are, are really great. Yeah, they're really, really important. And, you know, I mean, I hope and I think that more and more people are getting to that, that path, you know, really asking those good questions and, and of themselves and where they are conscious and that deeper listening that needs to happen and using like your healing keys in the back of your, you know, in your back of your beautiful book here and really understanding that, yes, thoughts are things and we can we can balance our lives and we can use your own energy to heal yourself and then look all the great work out there that's happening with even cancer patients today. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Really, really wonderful work. And sometimes we need to be reminded of it in today's world. There are amazing people just like you who are listening that are doing amazing things out in the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, my final thought for us is, please replenish your joy reserves. It's so important. It's not a bypass. Remember that, you know, coming into your joy is a way of coming back into the blissful being that you are. You know, in our traditions, we say that pure consciousness, which is what we all truly are, mm -hmm. is omniscience, presence, and bliss. And so when we allow times to come back into the joy, we replenish our energy, we come back to our soul nature and then let our soul guide the process. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shimani, for sharing with us today. You all want to check out and get involved in Chi, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, and definitely the Energy That Heals documentary coming up. Do you have a date for that yet when that's coming out well, so we can share it? Well, I will say, you know, it's fundraising dependent. So okay. we're doing pretty good right now. Um, for anyone listening that may want to learn more about how you can contribute, we have invitation-only gatherings with Leading Lights um, to have deeper discussions about the project. If and when all, you mm -hmm. know, all resources provided for the project, our aim is to have this out in early 2025. So okay. we're, as I mentioned, 75% of the way done with filming. We have already over 30 amazing leading lights, um, including all the stars in the project. We will be doing deep editing and kind of exploring the distributions. We wanna get this out there, you guys, on the biggest you know, platforms, streaming platforms, PBS. Um, it's all achievable. Um, we understand the strategy of how to do it. So with everyone's you know, con contributions and support mm -hmm. to this, we'll be able to get that movie out in early 2025. 
Oh, that's so awesome. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. That is just so, so, so awesome. Thank you so much for the good, for this opportunity to be with you today. Um, Shmini, and also all the work that you're doing in the world. And, you know, if you're listening here, definitely check out that documentary coming up in 2025. Find a way to get involved here. Get involved with Chi. Get involved with her consciousness initiative. It is amazing the work that they're doing and how this can spread because it's a group effort, everyone. So again, thank you so much for being with us. This has been such a, such a gift. And remember, everyone, follow your heart, but take your brain with you. Thank you.